Uh, and we tested that uh, and then the, uh, what's called a competence model. So there is a theory of status that's that's based in competence, but it's basically benefit conferral. And we found evidence in favor of the competence model and the benefit conferral model, but almost no evidence for the cost inflicting model. Indeed, what we found is that uh, although sometimes people have the ability and willingness to inflict cost, you have to be more differentiated even about that. So for example, we we've been talking about coalitions to some degree, and uh, people punish uh, free riders, for example, mm -hmm, or, mm -hmm. or, or cheaters with yeah, coalitions. Yeah, 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 they punish them. So that's an infliction it, of cost. Yeah, it's an infliction of cost, but it's for the, the larger group, for the larger coalition. And so, and so that's why this notion that you could, or even like if you take extreme cases, like uh, as, as I'm sure you're familiar with, like in some nations, some people kill to get to the top of the hierarchy. So Big Daddy Amin, uh, in I can't remember which country, it was maybe Zimbabwe or Zaire, I can't remember, uh, basically was, was a thug who, who killed his way to the top, but you can't get to the top through this cost infliction strategy unless you're also conferring benefits. And so even he, even though he was a, a thug and continued um, his kind of reign of terror, he had a large um, coalition of um, under him uh, that all the benefits went to. Uh, that was and, and Idi Amin, Uganda? Yeah, Uganda? Yeah. Yes, yes, Uganda, yeah, thank yeah, you. Yeah. Yes, yeah, Idi Amin. Okay, yeah. so, so hey, this experiment, so here's another thing that could be pitted in that competition. So imagine you had people who, men who could confer benefit and who were incapable of inflicting, inflicting cost and men who could confer benefit but were capable of inflicting cost. I think you'd see winners on that side because of that free rider problem. And so, and that ties yeah. into our, what we'll discuss in relationship to the dark triad because, because there's some mystery about why women seem to be attracted to these so-called dark triad traits. And I would say that they're using them as insufficient markers for the ability to or the acquisition of status. So, and narcissists capitalize on that, right? Because a narcissist looks yeah. confident and yes. lots of confident people are competent, but some confident people aren't competent, but they can <laughs> fool you. Yes. And then I think the other explanation is that if you had to choose between a benefit conferrer who could punish free riders and one who couldn't, you should pick the former. Uh, one who, the, one who the could, one who could, who okay. could deal with free riders, who yes, could and yeah. would had the capability to, and so yes. you see, you see this sort of thing. I really like the Disney movie Beauty and the Beast. I yeah. think it. I think they got it right. And so there's Gaston in that movie, and he's a narcissist, but he's he has physical prowess. Like he can't understand why he's not the guy, but he's narcissistic. And then there's the Beast, who's a beast, but he's tameable. And so yeah. he, he can be a benefit confer and he has the capacity to inflict cost. Yes. Yeah. And, and, and the two are often correlated in nature. So like, for example, if you have physical prowess or athletic ability, then you have both the ability to confer benefits, you know, in the form of, say, protection or hunting skills, but also the ability to inflict costs by, you know, Okay, so let's talk about the dark triad then in relationship to agreeableness, because the dark, do you want to just yeah. tell everybody what the dark triad is first so that we're all sure. on the same page? Yeah, so, so the dark triad, um, I think this was originally named by uh, uh, one of your Canadian psychology colleagues, Del Paula, so yep. at the U UBC. And it, the dark triad originally was uh, uh, three uh, triad. Uh, but it's narcissism, Machiavellianism, and psychopathy. So where narcissism is typically marked by a sense of uh, grandiosity, um, a sense of uh, entitlement. Um, uh, they think they're the most intelligent, the smartest, uh, the most attractive, the most charming, the most skilled, et cetera. Uh, or in the words of one of my former graduate students, they think they're hot, but they're not. Uh, so, uh, and I think, I think there's a way in which um, people do have the ability to assess whether that uh, high self-esteem is uh, warranted or not. 
you know, because we have even words in our language for things like arrogant, you know, that kind of uh, uh, connote someone who is uh, thinks that they're more beautiful or more intelligent or more capable than they actually are. So nar that's narcissism. But the entitlement is, a, I think, a critical component of narcissism where they feel I, I'm so great. I'm, I deserve a larger share of the pie, including the sexual pie, if we, when we get to the issue of sexual conflict and sexual coercion. Uh, Machiavellianism, uh, I mean, that stems from the, 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 the prince of, uh, I can't remember how many hundreds of years ago that was written, but um, it's basically people who pursue um, an exploitative social strategy. So they can, they, they are, when we were talking about reciprocity earlier, they will feign reciprocity, feign being uh, good reciprocators, but then they will, they will cheat. And so these are the the, the liars, the cheaters. Uh, right. So if the if the patriarchy was based on exploitative power, then dark triad personality traits would be adaptively and practically useful and desirable. If yeah. that was the case. Yeah. If that if that if, was the case. Yes. But, yes. Okay. Uh, now, and that gets complicated because one of the things your research has indicated is that there there is a manner in which women are attracted to people who manifest dark triad traits. Yeah, I would say I would add the qualifier that it tends to be younger women. So teenagers or women in their early 20s, uh, women, as they mature and get more experience mm -hmm. on the mating market, tend to be less attracted to these uh, dark triad characters. OK, so uh, here's a here's a hypothesis. It's not that easy to distinguish the willingness to use casual power and, and control from competence when you're not very experienced. And so the dark triad types can feign, feign status related competence and they can ensnare naive women. Yes. Yeah, that, that, that's okay. right. And, okay. and they, they also have some qualities that women genuinely do desire. So the, they tend to, like the narcissists, tend to put themselves at the center of attention. And one of the things we know about status hierarchies is that uh, the attention structure is very important. That is, the high status people tend to be those to whom the most people pay the, the most attention. Uh, and so women are drawn. I, I, one anecdote, a, a female colleague of mine, very intelligent evolutionary psychologist, said, went to a conference and found herself very attracted to the organizer of the conference. And then six months later, she, he, she encountered him and he was just a normal attendee at the conference. And she didn't find him very attractive. She wondered, what was I thinking? But what it was is he was he was at the center of the attention structure. Well, the, and and the, the attention structure is an unbelievably reliable indicator of what's valuable because we don't devote our visual attentive resources to anything that isn't of singular value in the environment. And so that's why we yes. get, uh, precisely why we compete for attention. Uh, it's also an extremely valuable resource. Absolutely. So, I mean, a, a valuable and limited resource. It's finite. And so really at every moment in time, we're making decisions about yes. what to allocate our attention to. I read a funny study once, you might be aware of this, where monkeys, I think they were green monkeys, but I'm not sure, were shown photographs of other members of their troop, and they gazed much longer at the high status individuals in the photographs. Yeah. So, and you know, and, and then you think about that too, there's, there's something really interesting about that because imagine that that compulsion to attend to what acquired status or let's say competent status is accompanied in human beings by a profound instinct to imitate. Right. That's right. Because, um, I mean, we are, we are social learners. And one of the things that we try to do is to emulate those who have qualities that are associated with status. You know, and and that that gets into, you know, and, and those those vary from group to group and subgroup to subgroup. And in the modern environment, we have this uh, kind of a weird situation of a proliferation of status hierarchies, you know, where you can be the I don't know, the top social influencer where the only thing you have going for you is I don't know, a line of makeup or something like that or, or nothing at all. I mean, Paris Hilton was like famous for being famous. And so she got a lot of attention, but there was no, no, no real benefit there. But you know, we have like a you can if you're if you play video games, for example, which which I, I don't happen to, but 
uh, there are status hierarchies within those. You know, the most skilled video game player, the most skilled football player, rugby player, tennis player. Yeah, well, it's a good thing, you know, that we can create all these competence hierarchies because what it yes. means is that diverse talents have the opportunity to acquire the status that might also all, all, alternatively entice them to violence, let's say, because that is associated with status inequality. And so one of the solutions to status inequality is diverse games of competence, as diverse right, a yeah. range as possible.